Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Good morning. Uh, it's great to see all of you. My name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the director of the East Asian Institute, and it's my great, great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Albert Keidel to uh, give a talk uh, today. And uh, Dr. Keidel will speak on, on uh, economic policies in China and the success of those economic policies. And I, I could not imagine anybody better positioned than uh, Bert Keidel. Uh, I know for a fact because he really was my teacher in China in the early days when I was a young economist in the World Bank and Bert was working at the World Bank and he taught me everything about China at that point. And I still appreciate that very much so. Uh, Bert Keidel uh, is also the author of a recent book. So if you want to get all of his wisdom, don't just listen to today's uh, seminar, but also look at his book, China's Economic Challenge, uh, which is available at World Scientific. Professor Kaido has a very long and distinguished career in, in, in working on China, but also on Korea and Japan. Uh, and as I said, he worked with the World Bank. He's currently a professor at uh, uh, George Washington University. Uh, he used to work at the World Bank, at the Treasury, at Carnegie, uh, and at UNDP and all related to basically to China and East Asia. So he has an enormous wealth of experience that uh, we can benefit from in the seminar today. Professor Keidel, Bert, over to you. Thanks very much, Bert. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here and I appreciate the invitation and thank uh, all of you for uh, tuning in. Today, I want to review one of the main conclusions of the book that Bert uh, showed you, China's Economic Challenge, Unconventional Success. Uh, one of the things the book emphasizes is uh, the continuity in China's economic policies right through the last decade, through the, uh, the Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang uh, government. Uh, it seems to me that those policies and strategies really, uh, in many ways, are continuations of what was going on in the uh, previous decades. Uh, and it's true if we're talking about sort of the normal inherited plans and programs, but it also seems true that if we talk about the ways that uh, Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang governments have reacted to what we can call unexpected developments, of which there have been uh, quite a few in their term, uh, even those reactions in circumstances really quite different from the past, it seems to me show attitudes and basic postures similar to those of other officials uh, in the past. Uh, this book, China's Economic Challenge, also enumerates a number of domestic and international economic policy principles uh, behind China's economic success, as I see it. Uh, these principles support the conclusion of overall policy continuity. The principles are somewhat different from corresponding principles, you know, mainly espoused in the West. For example, a simple example is China's central bank is not independent uh, from its government executive authority. Uh, this seems to function as support uh, for fast acting counter-cyclical fiscal programs uh, that uh, need uh, financial backing. Uh, and so it's, it's again, it's a, it's, it's a convenience is, and, and so far it seems the Chinese uh, have not abused it. Uh, it also seems to me that these strategies uh, that are consistent with the past uh, have continuity and are in operation now so that if we take them sufficiently into consideration, they could be a useful guide to what's likely to come next year and even uh, in the coming rest of this decade. Uh, as I get going, I also want to add a more preliminary perspective. Uh, as we consider this pattern of economic policies, uh, I think we need to acknowledge that China's overarching economic task seems to be development, poverty reduction, and overall modernization. So this points to practical considerations rather than following slavishly some uh, formula or some ideological uh, posture that they've gotten from somewhere else. Uh, its goal is not to promote this or that strategy or ideology for its own sake. It seems to me that China wants to do whatever works best to modernize uh, in the confines, of course, of its domestic and international uh, political environment. <clears throat> so the question is, what is the best way for China to continue to advance its overall economy uh, in a world that has been and still is far ahead in really per person capital stock accumulation, 
uh, and uh, modern technological capabilities. Uh, it also seems to me that in fundamental Western economic terms, China's consistency uh, with the past uh, is also consistent with a basic Western economic theorem called the theorem of the second best, which is used in the book to explain how, why many of China's policies are in fact appropriate, even if they may not seem to fit the needs of, uh, of say, a market economy uh, in its most idealistic uh, version. This, this theorem of second best is a 1956 a theorem by Lipsy and Lancaster. And basically it says that if one characteristic of a market economy uh, is missing, the economy is no longer first best, uh, instead it's second best. And in that case, policy choices based on free market theories just may not be a good idea. Instead, they could do a lot of damage. So what can policymakers do in a second best economy? The right answer, is to have the best detailed information available about the economy and make practical decisions based on that information. Seems to me this is what the Chinese have been doing. Basing decisions on some idealized theory is a mistake, according to this theorem of second best. And China's clearly a second best economy. I mean, at, at, at least in terms of, only if you look at the division of its population between a registered urban population and a registered rural population uh, that establishes a, a very difficult gap uh, that has been one of the major focuses of China's policy uh, since the beginning of the, uh, the new reforms after Mao's death. Uh, so China's policy approaches to me seem to be adhering quite closely to the theorem of second best. And I think that gives them a lot of credibility. In particular, it's, it's careful not to rely on laissez-faire liberalization, which I think sometimes we're quick to say that that's what reforms should be. Reforms ought to be liberalized. That's the meaning of reforms. And China, of course, has backed away from that or it's qualified that or it's tried it and, and stepped back again. Uh, and so that... But, and yet, in, in many people's minds, then it hasn't reformed if it hasn't fully liberalized. And so I think that this, uh, the wisdom of that de definition is called into question by the theorem of second best. So let's ask, what is the proof of continuity in the past decades economic policies uh, with strategies and decisions in previous decades? I, I think there are quite a few. Uh, I may miss some that others will say are proof of discontinuity. So I'll be interested in the discussion uh, to see uh, are things I haven't thought of or haven't considered adequately. So please bring those in or send those questions into BERT uh, as we go forward. Uh, there are many sort of standard ways. I mean, if you look at the 2013 third plenum document uh, and compare it with the 2010 production of a five-year plan for the five years, 2011 to 2015, there's very close organizational structure, content, so that the continuity with the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, the government is, is very plain, at least in this whole broad swath of policies that are in that third plenum, which also has a lot of new initiatives in it that we can, uh, I will bring up in a minute. But this, the steady passing on of a whole uh, rafts and departments and sections of the economy uh, with ongoing reforms and, and investment programs and projects and so forth. This is kind of a, a, a no-brainer for the continuity, uh, and, I'm, and it may not be uh, what most people consider as very important in that context, but it has to be mentioned. An interesting example of this, the who one government has had a Pearl River development programs launched in 2008, in fact, its launch was speeded up by the financial crisis because the local government had been resisting it. Uh, and it was this development plan for the whole Pearl River Delta that we have since seen uh, accomplished really in the investment programs around Hong Kong, uh, all of its connectivity with the agglomeration of urban areas in the Pearl River Delta, uh, all the way over to Macau with this remarkable bridge and tunnel combination. Uh, th that is such a symbol of continuity between a, a really a, a bold plan and initiative that then involving in evolving under the Hu Wan government. The, the Xi Li government picked it up and continued it just, uh, if anything, accelerated it. So that to me, this is just another kind of standard programs continue on. Their, 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 their effectiveness is uh, amplified and uh, appreciated uh, by the following government. 
uh, there's this interesting 2018 to 2022 rural revitalization plan. There was a five-year plan to revitalize uh, the rural areas. Uh, and to me, that, that just seems to be a continuation of the, the new village construction movement, the, you know, the Nongsun Jiansha, the Xin Nongsun Jiansha Xiaomu, uh, that uh, was such an important part of the second half of the 2000s in organizing and re-signing re land and commercializing and helping prepare uh, workers to go to the cities. I, I witnessed a lot of that uh, change in the rural areas in my many visits to China in, in the latter part of the 2000s. Uh, and so I, that to me is just the next step. It, it also has served as a continuation of the poverty program, which has sort of been closed, but its office is reopened as the uh, rural revitalization program, uh, which is kind of the next stage in overall rural development. But it's clearly uh, just strong, powerful continuation with the uh, major thrust of reforms, which in, in, to my mind, reforms include a lot of, of a building of new institutions that will be able to handle uh, market forces. Uh, and so this rural revitalization uh, continuation uh, is, is a very clear example to me. I want to mention, of course, the COVID-19 response. Uh, it's built clearly on what China learned during SARS in 2003, 2004, uh, the, the, the realization that they had to be ready to, since SARS turned out not to be as, as community transmissible uh, as COVID-19 was, uh, it, it, it was resolved in ways that didn't cause a, a, a serious global pandemic, uh, although there were significant deaths, mostly on the mainland. Uh, but at, at because of SARS, preparations were being made uh, on the mainland to deal with the next pandemic. Uh, and that response then was fully uh, rolled out uh, when COVID-19 was finally identified as being a community transmissible, uh, not just individually transmissible. Uh, and so, and, and of course, we're, we're now facing what to do about that response. How, how, uh, how can China learn to live with lockdowns? Uh, it, there are uh, you, you have to say that at least China's labor force is entirely intact, uh, so that that continuation of a past principle, of a public health principle, uh, has, has paid off. Uh, in the first two years of the pandemic, China's economy grew 10%. Uh, it, uh, and, and I think that pattern is something, as I'll mention in a while, that we can expect to continue to see. Uh, I'll, I'll shift now to talk about the regulatory crackdown on the real estate firm. This is, uh, I see a continuity here. I mean, you may think it's stretched, but going back to the state-owned enterprise reforms and the state bank recapitalization programs, uh, they they were a, a, a major effort to go into the guts of, of financial relations on multiple sides. And now it's, as I understand it, the the re-regulation or the regulation of the finances of the real estate industry uh, and in a way the bailing out or the, the reconfiguration of their finances so that the, the industry can continue uh, is, a, is a practical application of what government leadership can do if it doesn't have to rely on, on, on mandatory bankruptcies or other things it can reach in as the theorem of second best indicates it has to do because it's a second best economy. Uh, and take the steps to solve these problems uh, in whatever way seems most practical and to discard solutions if they seem just uh, to lead to disastrous outcomes, not to continue with them because they seem in principle uh, to be the right thing to do. So th that uh, that linkage with, with sort of this past spirit of, oops, we've got financial problems and, and major enterprises that are uh, not able to manage their obligations, let's go in and fix it. I mean, it's the way that uh, a, a good bank regulator works out failed banks and make sure that the depositors are uh, kept whole, at least up to a degree. And this is what China seems to be practically implementing uh, in that same spirit uh, from uh, really over 20 years ago. Uh, there is a sense in a lot of the writing that I see here in Washington, uh, of course, I see it from everywhere, but a lot of it's being written in Washington about this, the importance or the overimportance or the abuse of China's use of state-owned enterprises. Uh, and uh, and I, one first reaction is to say this is really a continuation of the 1990 reform, seize the large and let go the small. 
uh, and there's a sense that maybe China should grow out of that, seize the large. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it is something that is used worldwide. I, I like to the term cost plus corporations. You have them in every country. They often are defense related or they're linked to critical technology uh, research institutes that uh, are, are not able to support themselves by selling the results. But uh, the government knows that these entities need to be kept together. They are a critical body of uh, information or of technology, uh, of handling of materials and designs and so forth. And so they are held together, even if they are private corporations in some countries. China's case, they're state-owned enterprises. Uh, and they serve uh, uh, important roles in producing results, even if it's just uh, not just, but if it's high-speed rail production, which is just an extraordinary uh, accomplishment that the Chinese have done over the last, say, 15 years. But is this a left shift in China's ideology, or is it a continued realization that these enterprises are really critical to avoiding bottlenecks uh, over the horizon if we should get there with uh, a successfully rapidly growing economy and run into bottlenecks that because we didn't take care of uh, the long-term preparation for that uh, environment. I, 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 I think that the SOE uh, continued importance in the Chinese economy is, is a continuity with the past uh, and one that is likely to be continuity into the foreseeable future. Uh, I'm, I notice in another area that the recent financial measures continue supporting private micro enterprises. So this is the other end of the spectrum in terms of enterprises that they, uh, and this is continuity ever since uh, the breakup of state-owned enterprises, the large-scale layoffs, the efforts to try to find work for those that were xiaogonged uh, and then uh, perhaps then left unemployed. So I, I think this is a, a con con you know, it's continuity with the past effort to expand the private sector in particularly in a lot of small scale, le heavily labor intensive uh, sectors. Uh, so there is a, one that is dear to my heart because I spent a lot of time working on this in the 2000s, uh, which is the integration of the rural workforce into the urban area. Uh, there were really impressive pilot programs done in the 2000s, particularly 2005, 2006 in Zhengzhou, you know, the capital of Hunan province, uh, ran into a lot of problems, experimented with uh, how to have schools, the transportation system uh, with relaxing or eliminating the requirements uh, for hukou registration. Uh, it, it, it's a program that you could began way back in the 1990s with a blue card program in Shanghai, how to integrate uh, the rural population in a productive way uh, into the, the urban system. And so we now have a situation where there more than half of the urban population uh, is, is not an, an urban huko and what to do about the, the gaps there. Uh, there is this 2014 new urbanization program that the, uh, the Xi Jinping, uh, Li Keqiang government uh, rolled out in 2014, uh, which is a clear continuation of this whole effort to, to build a, a, a heavily urbanized China uh, in a way that is orderly uh, and, and serves the rural population well as it comes in. But it, it, uh, it's, it's still sort of, you could say, waiting to take off. Uh, and this book that I've written, China's Economic Challenge, posits that one of the reasons for that is that in this last decade, the financial sector has been uh, a bit unstable. Uh, and the Chinese even call it, uh, you know, a, a waterbed financial system, because if you try to put money in one place where you think it's strategic, it'll pop up somewhere else. And you try to suppress that, then it pops up in a third place, maybe in the stock market or in the in a real estate bubble in high end, high priced real estate or in the capital flight. There's this whole pattern. The book has a diagrams about it in the in the 2010s uh, of the waterbed economy effect. Uh, and so that is a function also of the abuses uh, that the Xi Jinping, uh, Li Keqiang government experienced the, in the aftermath of the financial crisis in China stimulus program, using a lot of platform companies of off budget local government entities that were in charge of various programs. That program was uh, seriously abused. A lot of local government officials uh, 
provided those benefits for profitable firms for friends. So the, the corruption in that issue was also then something that the, Li Keqiang, that the Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang government had to respond to. And hence we had uh, the anti-corruption campaign early in the Xi Jinping period. Uh, and I would say also that that was a major motive for the third plenum's uh, decision to establish a central leading group on finance and reform. Uh, it really was targeted at local government officials, how to be able to implement at the local level projects going forward in, in ways that didn't uh, sort of bleed out reform funds and uh, activities into uh, the private sector when the funds were meant to go in public directions. Uh, I'm very interested in how the effort to, to produce subsidized housing uh, in adequate terms. This has been a growing, it's part of course of the urbanization efforts in the 2000s and it builds off of the privatization of housing in the late 1990s and early 2000s. But the, uh, of course, housing then becomes unaffordable for a lot of poor, lower income people, particularly migrants. Uh, and so the recent steps to make this the local governments more responsible, even different sections of the same city to have autonomy in terms of how do they resolve the housing issues, how do they resolve the, the need for affordable housing. Uh, to me, this is just complete continuity uh, with past efforts to try to handle the this book, uh, China's Economic Challenge, has uh, diagrams that show the, the variation in funding available for tiny housing, for mansions, which are, of course, the high-end housing. And we're faced with the situation, it's a very second best uh, conclusion that the, the private sector in housing construction will want to build the biggest, fanciest, most expensive improvement to a piece of land that it can. But that's not the best solution for the nation's housing problem. So you, we're, we've been looking at uh, different ways to afford uh, affordable housing, to pay for it. A lot of, a lot of innovation uh, in, the, in, in the 2000s, in the latter 2000s that were picked up and worked with uh, in, in, the, in the Xi Jinping, the Keqiang government. And so I, I just see that same continuity, the problems are real, uh, and, and, and the central government can't decide how to solve them so that they're, they are now saying, you, you've got to work this out according to affordability principles, uh, but at different local levels, depending on what your situation is. I find that just such a healthy improvement and ongoing continuation of uh, very credible ways of dealing with this difficult problem uh, in the past. In logistics, it's, I mean, uh, Bert and I remember being in China when they were prefabricating huge uh, urban highways and dropping them in place. Uh, and so that the, the logistical expansion uh, around cities and I remember highways that, uh, had had almost no traffic on it when I would bring a senior official to come take a look at it. And they say, well, what is this? What have you got? And, and of course, a year later, uh, it was packed with traffic. Uh, so that the rapid pace of the expansion of these uh, uh, of the of the inf of the infrastructure for transportation and now, of course, in the that's the continuation with the uh, high speed rail expansion is 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 just very obvious to see. Uh, and uh, it, it's also actually just as a footnote, very interesting to see how China acquired legally all the technology from four different global uh, high speed rail companies in France and Japan and Germany, uh, figured out their technology and then produced a composite uh, train technology that was as good, if not better than their top line. So this, uh, this continuity of how do we link the country together that was clear in the 2000s uh, with the highway is now sort of jumped into hyperspace with these uh, high-speed rail lines. In domestic finance, uh, uh, there is this, the gradual regulatory strengthening of shadow finance uh, and of interbank activity, I think, is uh, its continuity. It's a necessary strengthening of the operation of earlier financial liberalization programs. They were needed, they were bold, but they ended up, of course, uh, with abuses. Uh, and so the finance companies, and I interviewed a lot of finance companies in the early 2000s, very creative, very innovative, uh, but and, 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 and extremely useful, but they also 
ended up being part of the waterbed economy in some dimensions, a waterbed financial system. And so the better regulation of those with uh, that finally came into fruition really in the last three or four years of the previous decade, the, the last decade with uh, un under uh, the first two, ter two terms of, of Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang. I think that if you're rolling along and introduce new institutions and new freedoms, and then they cause problems and you react to them in this way. Uh, it, it, I think it's a, it, it's, it's overdoing it to say that this is a, a step backwards. Uh, in fact, it's a step forward so that those uh, financial arrangements and institutions can be uh, more effective uh, and serve a, a better purpose. So again, continuity uh, with previous reforms that actually improve them and make them do a better job for the Chinese economy and in intermediating uh, savings into uh, what are the best uses of those funds. Uh, I, I'm very interested, and this goes back a, lo a lot longer than just a decade or two, but the treatment of Ant uh, and of its spokesperson, Jack Ma, is a fascinating uh, sort of bringing up to date what was uh, an important principle that Deng Xiaoping uh, emphasized in the 1980s. Uh, and it had to do with, uh, with, a, with a Chinese word uh, that also has gotten some attention, although not, it didn't get the attention. It's a word that's frequently mistranslated. It's a word called zhuan zheng. Uh, and it has to, zhuan zheng in its correct interpretation uh, means uh, which group in your society uh, exercises ultimate influence and control over the levers of governmental power. So it's a group against group concept of, of ultimate control, if you will, Zhuan Zheng. Uh, it is uh, been, it, it, the translation that's still in use today is a late 1800s translation. Uh, when, for example, landlords would complain about the dictatorship of democracy as an idea. So we're stuck with the translation of Zhuan Zheng as a dictatorship. But it, it's, it's a much more subtle uh, term, uh, and it was clearly part of Deng Xiaoping's four major principles, uh, the Zhuan Zheng of the people. Uh, uh, he would call it, the, it's translated in English as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, but when he explained it, it meant the Zhuan Zheng, the, the overriding influence within the government of uh, the people. Now, does the party represent the people? That's, that's a whole different question. But it, it nevertheless, what they don't want is the Zhuan Zheng of corporate finance or the, the, the Zhuan Zheng of the financial industry. Uh, and so Jack Ma, in my interpretation, really crossed the line when he began to lobby for deregulation of fintech. Uh, and that this began to sort of, this violated this deep principle from Deng Xiaoping on, uh, and Xi Jinping and his, his and the party uh, picked up on it and, and pushed him down. Uh, so that to me is, whether it's the right, whether it's the right mix of uh, allowing lobbying, lobbying provides a lot of information for the government from an expert uh, perspective, so forth, but as, con as continuity, as consistency with the past, this treatment of uh, Ant and Jack Ma and the listing, uh, the, de the, the re revoking of permission to list in New York, uh, all of that, it fits perfectly in that it's not, uh, to me, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang's government doing something totally different or breaking the trend uh, with the past. Instead, it's, it's, it's coming in with the consistency that they think is, is what's important uh, for managing the economy. Uh, Similar thing with the 2015 stock market bubble uh, with uh, an intervention of government to cap it. Uh, that was also, as I said, an example of this waterbed uh, financial system. Uh, but to me, uh, that's comparable to one job house response to the 2017 overheating. If you remember, the U.S. had a huge credit bubble. Uh, it was uh, funding a lot of imports from China uh, that were overheating the Chinese economy. They had 14% growth that year and very high inflation. And Wen Jiabao remarked uh, in March of 2017 that we are, you know, uh, unbalanced uh, and, 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 and need to really resort ourselves. And he introduced a really go slow tightening of credit uh, that led to the growth slump in the early, in 2008, before the financial crisis struck. So you've got this 
uh, this government intervention in what is an overheating response. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's been done in the past. Uh, it's sort of standard procedure. Uh, and I think that was the, in, the response of the Li Keqiang uh, and, and, and uh, Xi Jinping government uh, to the stock market bubble uh, in their term. So those are a lot of the domestic uh, signs that I see of continuity. Uh, I think there are a lot of international examples. Uh, for example, we're just seeing now uh, in, in increasingly shortened negative lists for foreign direct investment. And this is just a continuity uh, with the encouragement of foreign direct investment at a controlled measure uh, with its impact on the domestic economy that we've seen in the past. Uh, you know, the connect initiatives that allow offshore access to mainland stock and bond markets. This is an incremental uh, improvement that I think is totally, you know, consistent with the trends in the past, particularly in the the, grads, the sense of gradual opening to the outside uh, as a way to avoid uh, instability and discontinuity. Uh, I, I think the very recent licensing of foreign firms for uh, controlling interest in wealth management companies, these are just more and more examples of a gradual Con con continuity with the past relaxation in ways that seem manageable. Uh, and again, it's a second best theorem, a solution. Let's keep our eye on what's happening. Uh, be sure to step in if there's a problem, uh, but not to rely on hard and fast rules or hard and fast uh, solutions to problems that when, when we can have with, look directly and see what's going on. Uh, this financial account continuity has to do also with the 2013 plenum, uh, which promised, you know, a, a much stronger market forces uh, in the economy. And there was a lot of anticipation of a relaxation of the financial uh, account, uh, the capital account movements. And I think we have to say, a lot of people say, well, they didn't deliver that. And my, my conclusion is that they tried it and it didn't work, uh, that you had both the uh, relaxation of approvals for foreign direct investment, outgoing investment, uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, and it, it got out of hand. You also had in combination with uh, China's effort to uh, join the, the IMF drawing rights group of currencies, uh, relaxation of the exchange rate with the, uh, the, the August 11 reforms uh, in 2015. And in, in each case, uh, it turned out that it led to some instability uh, that was unacceptable. Uh, the loss of a trillion dollars in reserves, a quarter of the reserves that dropped China below 30% of its money supply in terms of reserves, uh, so that they pulled back. Uh, and, and instead, what we now have, uh, and, 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 and I would say this is continuity with the, con the way to find a way to, to open financially, uh, but you have these new free trade areas. There are now 21 of them, I think. Uh, and they're very interesting because uh, they, they they have an agglomeration effect. Certain sectors come together, but finances can flow more easily in and out uh, with controlled volumes. Uh, I think one international commentator said these are all like uh, a little Hong Kongs uh, in the sense that they're uh, they're quite open, but they're they're controlled in scale, uh, and they've been increasing in number. Uh, and so that if the if the massive opening was a disaster. The continuity is to keep working on that problem, but in ways that seem more manageable. And again, in a second best economy way uh, to keep them more manageable. Uh, so I, th I think that's an interesting alternative to the more general capital account liberalization and, and represents continuity uh, going forward. Uh, there, it, it, uh, if we take a look at, say, something that was unexpected, the Trump trade war tariffs. Uh, and the Biden administration's continuation uh, with this harsh line towards China, uh, at, at least through the recent midterm elections, uh, that it was also continuity. I mean, I, I like to go back to the Zhu Rongji arrival in Washington with what he thought was a done deal on WTO accession, and to find out that Clinton had switched and was now listening to American financial industry and saying, no, 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 this is not, uh, we're not done here yet. Uh, and uh, so what did China do? They, Zhu Rongji went back home and then he wouldn't talk to anybody. Jiang Zemin had to take over the negotiation. So they, they didn't let uh, the Clinton administration sort of start from what Zhu Rongji had thought had been uh, his done deal. They backed off and it turns out the American financial 
sector didn't get what it wanted uh, for quite a long time. Uh, so that this this way of responding to uh, sudden changes on part of the U.S., if you want to put it that way, it, there's a continuity. Uh, now it's we're in the midst of what's going on in that certain action right now, but I think the uh, the, the calm way that the, the Chinese are responding now uh, also has seems to me reflects an appreciation of what they know to be the political process uh, here in the United States. So uh, I, 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 that kind of ends my list of uh, recent developments uh, that I see are consistent with the past. Uh, I want to go back a little further, and I know this is going to be a big stretch, but uh, there is something about using the second best theorem guidelines, and I don't even know if the if Chinese officials know about the theorem of second best, but to me it's totally consistent uh, with what they're doing. It goes back to the late 19th century phrases in China about learning from the West to defend against the West. Whatever works, let's let's figure out what we have to do. And it seems to me that that spirit, which isn't necessarily communist or Marxist, uh, is, is part and parcel of what uh, the Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang, and earlier governments were working with. Uh, how much does Marxism uh, remain in China's emulation of the Soviet Union? Uh, so there's some question about what, what is China uh, emulating? What, what is the consistency? And I would say it has a strong flavor of what is China that is valuable and how then can we also learn from the world what will work for us? Uh, and for them, for a while, Marxism seemed to be the only thing that explained why they were uh, being overrun by the power of very much more advanced Western economies. Uh, they also learned a lot from the philosopher John Dewey uh, when he was lecturing in Beijing in the 1920s. Uh, his, he was an empiricist. Uh, it, I think he he argued that you need to, for public policy, he was interested in public policy, that you need to base public policy on empirical facts. What do you know the situation to be? What do you think the reaction would be to what you plan to do? Uh, and this is shushu chosha. This is, uh, you know, seeking truth from facts. Uh, it came from the philosopher John Dewey, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a factor in the continuity of Chinese policy uh, right up through today, of course, because it's, uh, it's part of their uh, vocabulary. Uh, so uh, that is my, my conclusion there. The, the, the theorem of second best seems to be uh, alive and well in China. Uh, I, I also have in, in this book, China's Economic Challenge, uh, sort of a, a, a concluding or conclusion list of the kinds of things that China has done that have been behind its success. How has China over 40 years accomplished 40-fold growth uh, and reduce poverty to the degree that they did by the end of 2020. How do they do it? And so if you tick them off, uh, the first two most important ones, it seems are to me, are very high investment share in GDP, 30 to 40%, if not a little more. Uh, and, and, and the second is effective and timely demand management. So you've got supply and demand. And it's, uh, it's interesting that if, if you look at some grand studies of growth that have come out in the past couple of decades, they're great on savings rates and technology change, but you don't hear them talking about demand. Uh, so, but one of the secrets of the Chinese growth is to be able to manage demand if it becomes overheated to temper that, but then to keep right back on. And we're seeing it now uh, with, with little pushes and dribs into uh, aggregate demand uh, to come out of some of these bottleneck uh, issues of these lockdown situations in Shanghai and around the country. But high investment shares, uh, and then the question is, of course, the IMF is saying, well, this needs to be rebalanced, that there's too much investment. I really question that. I th the, 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 the way, to me, and a consumption-led growth should be rapid consumption growth. And you only get that if the whole economy is growing fast. So there's kind of, to me, a, a false linkage between a higher share of consumption in GDP and consumption-led growth. I think if, I mean, if you think about it, uh, if you raise the share of consumption GDP, you're going to reduce the share of investment. And over the long run, that reduces your growth rate, which will regrow, which will slow down the growth of consumption. So I, I'm just not a fan of the consumption-led growth model. It's, to me, it's too linked to the notion that China has a trade surplus because it saves too much, uh, when in fact, an important part of what looks like China's foreign savings 
is, is actually generated by excess credit in the United States behind uh, its purchase of imports. Uh, and if you do, there's a little formula in the back of the book that shows that to the degree that U.S. imports are funded by credit creation rather than foreign exchange that was earned, that China's uh, China's surplus is not its excess savings, but is created by uh, the increase in liquidity that the U.S. has uh, put into the transaction. Also, you need an overall investment agency that has financing power. That's NDRC. You've got to have a, a comprehensive vision of how you're expanding your capacity, public and private. Uh, you, you need a really important investment emphasis on public goods. Uh, you need a well-run National Development Bank. Uh, the book goes over an, an earlier World Bank publication called uh, Finance for Development, which had in it a very powerful refute, refutation of the usefulness of development banks. Uh, and the book points out that that was based on an, uh, an, a pre-reviewed uh, version of an article uh, that uh, hadn't broken up its data between developing countries and developed countries and concluded that uh, if you have a development bank, you, you do poorly. Uh, instead, what the result was, in, in, and this is post-publication of Finance for Development, the, the peer-reviewed version broke up those data, and it showed that there is a bell curve uh, that has to do with the effectiveness of a development bank, of a national development bank. And there are large numbers of countries, developing countries, that have successful development banks. And of course, if you want to know what the most successful is, it was the State Development Bank in China. Uh, and the book describes uh, how its president uh, managed to get a uh, very good response to his uh, to his assets out there by uh, stopping loans to counties and municipalities once they uh, once one of their project wasn't uh, servicing adequately. You, so that's a that's an important lesson. You need a, a, a well-run development bank. Uh, you need, an, as I've said at the very beginning of my remarks, a non-independent central bank uh, which can accommodate priority projects. Uh, you need gradual domestic financial liberalization. Uh, and as I said, with state-owned enterprises, you need to subsidize cost-plus companies, state-owned enterprises. Uh, the, the, this, this list also includes uh, international sort of key decisions, trade protection, encouragement for FDI, so that you get the assembly trade, which is a guaranteed surplus. Uh, that's what explains China's surplus, is the assembly trade, not exchange rates. Uh, you have... Uh, Tight regulation of foreign financial flows, as we've talked about, avoidance of currency appreciation. The book describes China's situation in every country with the U.S. producing currency. It's a kind of Dutch disease uh, that is global and that therefore countries need to intervene to keep their currencies from appreciating uh, uh, excessively. Uh, you need to have some foreign exchange reserves. You need to accumulate them. China has done that. Uh, you don't want to borrow for your public budget. Uh, you need to acquire technology through FDI, uh, and you need to train your workers and send them abroad, uh, and you need pilot coastal programs like the, the export zones that I've talked about. So I'm going to finish up here. It, it seems to me that uh, all of these, con this, these terms of continuity are forward-looking. Uh, as I mentioned, China did well in the first ten, two years of the pandemic because it rebounded from uh, the Wuhan uh, decline in output in the first quarter of 7%, so that the next year's first quarter was 18%. Well, we've had all, we had zero growth in the second quarter of this year, uh, and I, I'm looking at maybe 11 or 12% growth in the second quarter of next year, and there will be a rebound. Uh, and if it doesn't happen next year because of a lot of lockdowns, it'll happen the year after that. And so that uh, seems to me that these many strengths and this consistency with the theorem of second best is is going to be part of China's economy going forward. And I, I don't see any way that uh, it's not going to be. So, Bert, back to you. That's uh, my conclusion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bert. This is uh, fantastic. I could probably argue on each and every point for a very long I'm time, sure. but, I, but I won't, but I won't. I'm sure anybody who has a question, please raise your hand. You have your react in your reaction button. There is a raise hand function. But let me kick off with one. And uh, of course, uh, the seeking truth from fact is very important. It's also important that the, that the cat catches mice. Now, you are very optimistic about a rebound, and, and, but, but economists in general have become less optimistic about China's future. 
And they basically say, look, potential growth is now a lot less. And that's in part because of misallocation of resources, in part because there's many people in the countryside that are not that are not uh, participating fully into the productive economy. Uh, huge waste in, in, among others, high-speed rail, and I can vouch for that. Uh, uh, so very high uh, percentage of, of investment going to uh, very marginal projects uh, for reasons of employment and all that. I mean, there's lots of, lots of things to say for it, but, but in the end, it means that, that you know, the, the, the potential growth rate is a lot less. There's still some optimists. Justin Lin says China can still grow at 7-8%. Uh, for the next 20 years, but but overall the consensus seems to be gradually reducing, and some come to uh, 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 um, Larry Summers' reversal to the mean, which means something between two and three uh, percent. A key part of that is productivity growth, and productivity growth. I mean, fair enough, it has been lagging around the world, but it has definitely been lagging around in China uh, because in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, productivity growth is very high now and, and accounting for one third or even more 40% of growth. Now it is barely one percentage point a year, which is lower than the US productivity growth. And so is, is the, my, so my question is, is the, the continuity still the right approach to this? Or do we actually need some more faster reforms in particular areas? Thanks. Well, that's a that's that hits the nail, uh, uh, you know, on the head in terms of uh, the discourse now in this whole area. Uh, I heard in Brussels last week uh, a very well-known global economist say that uh, convergence will stop at the end by the end of this decade, but between China and the U.S., which is consistent with say a two percent growth rate, and the U.S. is at two percent, so they're not going to converge anymore. Uh, let me first just mention my uh, different viewpoint on the productivity growth issue. I, uh, there was a professor named Harvey Leibenstein at Harvard when I was a graduate student there, uh, and he had written papers in the early 60s on factor X, uh, and he made the important point that, say, the productivity measured by i uh, it's hugely sensitive to demand hugely sensitive to demand. And if you look, if you think about uh, the fact that uh, in a production function or in the production process, we treat capital as a stock. But it really what it is, it's, it's a stock that produces capital services, capital goods services. And so that if you have strong demand, uh, it's going to produce more services. Maybe you go into overtime or maybe go into 24 hour a day service. Uh, or maybe you speed up the machines and add, add more, a little bit more labor, but it's the machine that becomes more productive because of demand. And so there is a, a, a misreading of what is thought to be productivity, uh, which is actually uh, demand. And so demand has been, has been slow in China in the last decade. And my argument in the book, uh, China's Economic Challenge, is that this is because they are trying to maintain uh, control over the financial sector and regulate it. And they don't want to begin putting more money into the economy when they can't control where it goes, where in the waterbed it pops up. Uh, and so what we've seen then is a, 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 a tepid stimulus program in that part when I said, you know, you need you need high rates of investment and good demand management. You need aggregate countercyclical demand management. This is what China has been doing now because it doesn't think it can control where that money is. It learned that in the financial crisis. It went into all of these uh, ping tai gongs, all of these financial uh, platform companies uh, that shouldn't have gotten the money. Uh, and it squirted out and was uh, not spent very effectively. So I, I, I think we see this what you get when you increase demand, say for an I-Corps, you not only get increased use of the new capital, but you start recording better use of all the capital in the capital stock. So it's a highly sensitive to demand. Uh, and so I think therefore we're really misreading the underlying productivity growth in China because we're, 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 we're taking what is really a sort of a tepid demand record for the last 10 years as a tepid productivity uh, sort of performance. Uh, and so when I look at 
the idea of state-owned enterprise inefficiency. Or, uh, and, uh, and let me address the high-speed rail. Uh, high-speed rail uh, has taken passengers off the other rail lines so that it now has a, a, a broader uh, capacity for freight uh, without having to invest any more uh, in freight and freight train lines because it has this whole uh, alternative for uh, passengers. Uh, and I think we're going to see that kind of uh, productivity enhancement come into its own. Uh, and the book really book goes out on a limb and says they haven't really yet implemented this new urbanization program uh, because they, they don't think they can control all the money that they're going to need to spend for water, sewer, housing for the rural population that moves in there, uh, and, and for a lot of the uh, expansion of the, of the urban areas. I mean, the, the, the new part in central Hubei province that is going to be, I don't know if it's going to be the capital, but it's a huge megalot, but that is going to require a lot of investment and a lot of growth. Uh, and so I, I, I think people that say the real, and you just said it, the, the real challenge to China is how to get its rural workforce into the formal workforce, not to be part of work gangs that come to the city and then go back again, but how to incorporate them into a modern urban economy. And I think the new urban reform program in 2014 targets that goal but I don't think it's been fully implemented yet. And when it does, we'll see quite a surge in, in investment uh, and that will look like an increase in productivity uh, and will be seen as uh, using all of this capacity they've been adding to at 40% of GDP a year, uh, being pr so productive economy-wide, not just for new investment, that we'll be surprised it'll have the same kind of uh, results that you were quoting from the past. I mean, and, and, and to be frank, in the past, uh, China hasn't grown at sort of 10%. It's only done that because it's overheated and you'll get 14% here. Or when they, when they reformed, you know, they, 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 they liberalized grain and cooking oil prices in, two, in, in 1991. Uh, that real and you and I that first trip you and I took to China was to go to try to figure out what to do about the inflation that we were seeing in China. And I don't think anybody was talking to us about the reform, uh, the liberalization of grain and cooking oil prices. It created this Keynesian bubble in the rural areas that they only brought back down in 1995-96 by forcing peasants to plant more grain. Uh, so I don't know, that, that's a kind of a rambling response to your questions. And I don't, uh, I'd be interested what others and what you think. Yeah, let me let me not continue this debate. Uh, Liao will leave, so she's still online. Liao, you had a question, a very interesting one. Maybe you can switch on your camera and come in. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Bert. And uh, thank you, Professor. Yeah, uh, my, my question is actually about the, uh, you know, uh, seek the truth from facts is uh, important as uh, both you and Bert mentioned. But uh, the, I think the current situation is that you know, different people explain the data in different way. Uh, and also, you know, the information cocoon, which, uh, you know, discuss a lot nowadays, uh, everybody has the information cocoon, especially for those policy makers. Uh, so I wonder, uh, what's your comments on this? And uh, if, you know, if this, the information cocoon really exists uh, for po policy makers, how can they get out of it? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's the you know that's such an interesting concept, information cocoon, uh, and you get people looking at uh, different strands of indicators about where, where where the trend is shifting and how much and why. Uh, and so I'm uh, uh, the way to break out of it. It seems to me is to focus on some of the major numbers, the macro numbers that uh, you, you can't be held in a cocoon. Uh, and so I look at uh, all the investment data. Uh, and I, I'm interested in the way that they're supporting aggregate demand. Uh, I, 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 th I think the investment levels are, are what are important uh, and they will be ramped up is what I expect, but that's really what to watch is, in, is investment because it has a, a, a it, the public investment has a triggering effect for positive expectations about consumer credit and consumer demand going forward. And so I, I think in COVID, a lot of the service sector industries are really being hit hard. 
Uh, and so it's hard for them to follow on in an expansion that is government led. Uh, but if if we can uh, move beyond that, or, you know, it's interesting if if China keeps having lockdowns, uh, it's, it, it comes equivalent to saying, OK, well, maybe we're going to have to operate as if we're missing a month out of every year uh, for the whole. That would be a lot of lockdowns. Uh, but you would then be growing from that base of 11 months. Uh, and, and, and the high investment rate will still generate very rapid growth after the initial year or two of slowdown. So I, I think as long as you have this focus on what does the country need uh, and how do we invest, I mean, then ways that can stimulate it enough, but not too much so that it overheats. Uh, I, I think we'll break out of what a lot of people are looking at much too much, the, for example, the productivity number. Uh, that's a kind of a cocoon. Uh, the, the the managers' reports on whether they're both, you know, see expansion or see reduction, or how much, what's the interprovincial traffic volume, and how is that changing? All of those are going to be dependent on these larger macro numbers. Uh, and so, I would just keep my, I'm going to keep my eye on the investment in uh, in both uh, the urbanization program and also these reforms in. That are now being quite localized. They're uh, how how to bring in the the, the rural population into more uh, a more hospitable and, and work environment. Uh, I think those will override a lot of this uh, what you're calling the the, the data cocoon. Uh, mm -hmm. Have I understood the data cocoon concept correctly? Uh, information cocoon, but similar, yeah, similar. It's just you only see what you want to see. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's so we call that the silo, right? Where you, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You different silos. Okay. But there's a big, there's a sort of a bigger silo that uh, you can't ignore, it seems to me. But thank you, that's a very interesting question. Thank you, thank that's you, Paul, Paul Handler. Thanks, Bert, and uh, hello, Bert. Hi, Paul. You might not remember we met in 2009 at Jan you were in Carnegie Bar when you yeah, first joined I'm with Carnegie. Carnegie. Yeah. And I had just joined, and I was at Jans Barris's uh, picnic at Battery right. Park in D.C. So it's I just went to her picnic uh, a month ago. Oh, there you go. The that, first one after COVID, her first post-COVID picnic. Well, it's good to see you after so long, and thanks for your mentorship of uh, Bert Hoffman because we've all benefited from it at uh, East Asian Institute. So thank you for that. I have too. I have too. <laughs> um, you know, my question is similar to Bert's, but I'm going to put it in a U.S.-China or international context. I, I understand your main conclusion about the importance of continuity in terms of China's economic policy over many administrations. I frankly wish there was more continuity uh, between U.S. administrations. We often have a sort of a pendulum swing back and back and forth. Yes. Having said that, Having said that, of course, that assumes, you know, as Bert mentioned, that the continuity includes the most sound and effective policies. So, frankly, I was I was happy to see a pendulum swing, you know, after President Trump left and Biden came in. So sometimes change is good. My sense is that your take is that many, if not most, of these continuities and policies are the right policies for China's goals and ambitions. Um, and so I'm just interested in your sense. Are there, you know, times where or instances where their economic policies, where they've, you know, the continuity has been strong, um, but they haven't been the most sound or most effective policies. I mean, if if you think outside the economic context, you could think of the China's one China policy uh, and the consequences of that. Or even, you know, as of late, zero COVID. Um, continuity with the zero COVID policy might not have been the best thing. Maybe they should have shifted earlier. Um, but I want to ask it in the U.S.-China and international context, because I suspect there's areas of continuity in China's economic policies and management and governance that might be terrific for China, um, but but have created tensions for China with other countries, in particular the United States. Uh, these are many of the areas I think the Trump administration was trying to get at in its negotiations, kind of the structural issues in China's economy. Um, and many countries now have sort of you know, reassess their own economic and trade relations with China in large part because of these. So where just, I mean, just a couple examples of where their their pursuit of continuity is in fact either detrimental to China or detrimental to China's relations with other major economies in the world. So Paul, just one clarification. Did you mean one China policy or one child policy? 
one child policy. Sorry, one child. Okay, policy. it's, it's, it's China, sort of important to have that. Did I say one China? No, I've, yeah, I've been one China policy too much these days with Taiwan. Okay. No, one child policy. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, those are great questions, uh, and Paul. I, uh, for example, I, uh, I think the uh, industrial policy stance that China has taken. Uh, which may be useful for China, and I think I probably would argue that it's uh, that that if they didn't have an industrial policy, they would be uh, irresponsible as a development government. Uh, but the way it was presented and the way it is seen by the business community, I was just uh, last night at a uh, at the U.S. China Business Council gala, uh, and 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 the concern is that it means subsidizing firms in China so that they are more competitive or overly competitive with American products. Uh, so this idea of industrial policy uh, as, a, as a core Chinese broadcast, I mean, made in China 2025, uh, really rubbed people the wrong way. Uh, and, and so then the question is, well, are there good and bad ways to have an industrial policy? Uh, and, and, and can you uh, support uh, in ways that don't that might be expansionary but aren't necessarily subsidies that affect the cost of production of the product. Uh, so that that is one. I mean, that's just an example. You, we can come back on that if you want. In terms of the one child policy, this book has a treatment of that that shows that it was it resulted from the US, from the Chinese military having computers in the 1970s that they'd gotten from the Soviet Union or somewhere else and they were modeling it and they saw this huge, bulge coming of, of the population from the age distribution tree that had uh, been given birth in the 1960s after the, the tightening of the, the Great Leap disastrous, which was really a, a crimped China's fertility. Uh, and that was no matter, you know, even, even if they kept uh, the, the fertility rate from the 1970s, it was going to be a, a, another four or five hundred million people than they than they wanted. And they saw it as a a disaster for the, the Chinese uh, national power going forward to have to allow that bulge uh, to have as many babies as they, they were having per female uh, in the 1970s. And I, I write in the book, it's not clear with the breakup of the communes and return to family farming, uh, what the per capita female fertility would have would have been and what that would have meant. I make I make some calculations in the book about if there was, for every family that had uh, a child uh, in the 1980s had one more, you pick up a couple hundred million people by 1990. Uh, so that the, and they were very aware of the, the impact on the structure of society, you know, of no aunts and no uncles and uh, because you just have one child, but they felt that it was essential. Uh, for the, really their national survival, not to let the, the, the population, the demographic transition really take off in the wrong direction uh, as, a, as, a, as a national priority. Now that has huge human consequences uh, and so forth. So I'm, I'm not sure that I, I would say that that was a mistake. It was a choice, a policy choice that had costs for a lot of individuals. Uh, and now, and, and, and of course, then the big variable is the status of women. If they're educated, working outside of the home and urban, uh, they don't want so many kids. So this is now the crisis that China's facing where the, where the party's trying to tell party members to have more kids. Uh, but that, those are, those are two responses. I, I, I think sometimes I think the response that China uses even for COVID uh, is, is so harsh and that you wonder, isn't there some better way to make the impact on that less abusive uh, personally? Uh, and yet, I don't know if that's a capacity problem uh, or the nature of trying to prevent this virus from staying alive. Uh, but I, I think that's a that to me is stands out as a sore sore thumb when I look at China policy is sort of the harshness of the implementation of a lot of their policies. Uh, but in terms of the economics, I think they can afford to make mistakes uh, if they are, you know, pushing what I'm calling the theorem of second best principle, which is to keep doing what looks right, correct it if you make a mistake. Uh, and the important thing is to invest and manage demand uh, and and do that with these financial institutions. I mean, the, the NDRC is, is has 
statutory responsibility of fiscal and financial policy and its advice to the state council. Uh, it's enormously powerful. Uh, and so uh, how do you make sure that that uh, doesn't make mistakes? There's no way you can keep it from making mistakes, but the idea is that you, you do damage control. Uh, I don't know, does that help, Paul? Give me no, some- those, uh, And I appreciate, those are thoughtful responses and thank you very much and uh, appreciate you, you uh, talking to us today. Thank you. Oh, Good to thanks see you. very much. Just adding one remark and I don't want to debate it because we need to go to the questions. But one thing that always surprised me is that China actually did not make full use of its demographic dividends. Yes, on the labor market, but it was actually very slow in starting to invest in people. And that's something you see now. So they only really started after the 2000s to seriously invest. If they would have done that much earlier, and Bert, you and I know that they were quite loose and they basically put the responsibility on county governments uh, for financing the education sector. And it really meant that there's, there's, there's you know, the, well, it's, it's um, one of the big arguments that basically China has underinvested in education now, and therefore it's going to be harder to become a high income economy, Scott Rossell's uh, argument, basically. Uh, I'm not sure whether that is completely true, and they've done a major catch up since then, but it's, it's if you want, I, I was, was, was quite surprised by that kind of policy. But yeah, let's go. Let I, I, sorry, we're not yeah, going to debate yeah. it. I, I don't want to monopolize the uh, the Zoom. Yeah. So we go to we go to uh, Srini, uh, Dr. Srini. Yeah. Thanks, Bert, and um, uh, thanks to you, Bert, as well for a, for a great talk. Uh, I'm uh, my question relates to you know your I mean your emphasis is on you know greater uh, investment that China needs to continue to make going forward, and then that leads to you know a consumption led economy, etc. But in the context of a few things that have already been touched upon, so the low productivity issue that Bert almost started off with, uh, and then you know we looked at the, demo the demographic issue from the one China policy perspective, but then you know uh, right now China, uh, China's demographic transition you know towards a you know a society where it's you know where where the the, the population is decline I mean, could be declining. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, my question is, you know, you have also mentioned, for example, you touched on a, 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 an increasingly shorter uh, a negative list for FDI. So, but when an F, when 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 a foreign investor is looking at China, they're looking at a demographic transition with with you know uh, an, an aging society, lower uh, productivity workers uh, than than the rest of the world. They're looking at institutional weaknesses, what they see as you know more uh, erratic if you may decision making um and then you know what you see as continuity of policy across multiple uh, administrations is sometimes seen by today's investors as killing the golden goose okay in terms of the regulatory uh, uh, you know, tightening that has been done on, for example, the tech companies. So uh, it's a very different perspective. Uh, you know, when you look at it over time, as you have over a lifetime of working on China versus a foreign direct investment investor looking at it today and saying, am I going to go into China today or not? And, uh, you know, so, and these are some of the issues that, uh, you know, I, when I've been discussing uh, with people, uh, you know, these are some of the concerns that they have and they're basically saying, look, if China is going to grow at 2-3% and the US is also going to grow at 2-3% on a risk-adjusted basis, why am I going to China in the first place? Okay, so, you know, and these are... Yeah, I think, I think your, your some, question is clear, yeah. Okay, uh, all right. And then, of course, similar issues on the, on the domestic investors on the private sector side as well. So I'll stop here. Any comments on this? Well, yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, I, I love this idea of killing the golden goose. Uh, the, there is a different perspective. I mean, there are different gooses. Uh, the, the foreign investor is interested in his or her uh, particular uh, private goose, uh, whereas the government is interested in the overall Chinese goose. Uh, and so that's, that's the difference in perspective. I'm very interested in the idea that, that there is an accepted view that China will slow to two or three uh, percent. I, I, uh, I don't see how that can happen where they have already been growing at 6% with, with temp, you know, tepid demand. Uh, and and, 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 and you don't have, we have very low inflation in China now, and we have for quite a long time. Uh, so that it, it seems to me that if, speaking of gooses, if they goosed up the demand a little bit, uh, it could jump a percentage point or two up in terms of growth rates rather than keep sliding. I mean, I, 
there was, you know, one of the things that I think there was an article in the Wall Street Journal where somebody made this mistake and they were looking at 2021 where the growth rate was 18% in the first quarter and then it dropped to uh, 8% and then it dropped to four or something. And, 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 and they said, oh, the, the growth rate is dropping. But of course, all it was doing was responding to what had happened in the year before uh, on those quarters. Uh, and when you when you average it out and you look at 2021 and, and, and it looks like we're going to get over 3% this year, even with the Shanghai lockdown, I, I just don't see a, 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 a slowing growth uh, to anything under five percent, and and I would and my guess is it's going to be higher. I mean, we're going to make five percent this this year and next year on average. We made it in the first two years of the pandemic at average five percent, uh, and so I, and 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 again with tepid demand, with really weak service sector demand, uh, when you have this economy that has been uh, the, I mean, you have to think of what is what is the the incremental capital output ratio, uh, and it's very sensitive to it's it's very sensitive to demand, I think. And so we're seeing something that doesn't look as good, but the underlying capital output ratio, uh, you know, I think is uh, is is lower uh, than most people think it is. And so that the the the, the, the money you get or the payoff you get from forty percent growth. It, uh, it's not going into, you know, elephant homes. It's, it's. I think a lot of it is productive investment. It's in manufacturing. It's in, it's in housing. It's in urban structures, and it's going to enable moving this, uh, this labor force from the rural into the urban areas. I'm convinced that's what they're going to do. And so I, th I think I, I hadn't realized that uh, people are saying that they have underinvested in, in, in education. I do know that in the late 1980s, uh, they had a a, a crash program nationwide to train middle school teacher trainers because they they really had capped in in the Mao's period in the early 80s elementary school was the standard and they were raising that to middle school uh, by the 1990s but it, they didn't have the teachers so they had a crash program not to train the teachers but to train the teachers that were going to train the teachers uh, so there was this sort of pyramid program and so I, I, I and and of course I I think they will continue to emphasize at the post high school level technical training uh, and practical skills, uh, and 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 they will. It's basically, it happened in the early '80s too. They de-emphasized, you know, the law and political science and sociology and so forth in favor of practical, uh, mechanically oriented or development oriented uh, skills at the university level. And I, I I still think they're they're they know what they need and they can move it forward. So I. I'm quite optimistic that we will come through this period where the financial sector wasn't reliable uh, domestically. It, it was not, and that showed very clearly in the stimulus program and the financial crisis, which is what then Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang were reacting to. You know, that was a kind of a disaster of waste, of inefficiency. Uh, and so they've, they've tightened up the shadow financial market and the interbank market that's such a clear part of it. Uh, and I think they've got to clean up the real estate financing mess and they're doing it uh, and they'll then be able to rely more on a financial sector that they can regulate to make sure that it's used well uh, and the investments will start paying off so i i'm i'm really perplexed i mean the one you know the one good thing about predictions that china's economy is going to crash uh, to two percent growth is that it might persuade the u.s congress not to do anything permanent in terms of legislation that that outlaws China. Uh, that's a real threat right now, that the political process in the United States is, 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 is unfriendly to China because it's so easy to do and so easy to uh, be, you know, be accused of soft on China, which will persuade a lot of Americans that you're not a good leader. So I'm, you know, maybe that's what's going on, uh, but I'm, I hope it's it's not isn't going to stick. But I just don't understand. As an economist, I don't understand with all the investment and the quality uh, that they're getting in terms of technology change and the educational spending that that uh, they're not going to keep growing. I just don't see it. The two to three percent again comes from Larry Summers. It's the it's the average of uh, developing countries after growth spurts. So uh, that that's what that's where it's coming from. So if China were to be a normal country. They would have already come back because this this is an article of 2013. They would have already come back to two to three percent growth, and obviously they well, haven't. You know, Larry Summers has a, a long career. Uh, I don't know. 
I don't know that he's really reflecting the differences that China's policy and institutions have made to its growth that are different from other developing countries. No, no he's, he's not. But, but, but so, so this is just an average over developing countries. Okay, well, that's good to know. That relieves me then. It's, it's Sarah, Sarah Tong, Dr. Sarah Tong. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for a very uplifting um, speech. I, I do share uh, quite a bit of uh, thinking with Bird. I, I have question question marks for uh, for some of the points, uh, but I'll, I'll share three things, uh, two minor points and one uh, kind of comment slash question. Uh, first point about growth, um, just uh, just the numbers that, that we have right now. Um, from, 20, uh, from 2011 to 2019, this is before COVID, uh, growth has come down from 9.55 to, uh, to below six. So it is uh, in, in this, uh, this de last decade, decade uh, growth is coming down. Uh, suppose that uh, the COVID period has not permanently dropped the overall trend uh, if we continue what happened from 2011 to 2019, uh, we are going to see growth uh, coming down uh, regardless. Suppose that COVID doesn't do anything. So that's the first point. Second point on, on Li Yao's sharing a question about information earlier. I'm, I want to share a joke uh, that was uh, in China's uh, social media about COVID. The joke was, the joke was is that it's not the most difficult thing to to discuss an issue with someone who is who has not sufficient uh, information, but it's very difficult to argue or discuss with someone who has already been implanted an answer. Um, so so this echoes what Li Yao says: we tend to see facts, quote unquote, that we want to see. So that's my second minor point. The, the major question, the major point I have is uh, the continuity that we have observed, of course, we all see, we have all observed uh, many of the policy continuity, um, but I'm afraid that, are we talking about the continuity in, in overall policy or I would, I would say that the, uh, the, the leadership or the party has, a very consistent, very consistent ultimate goal, which is to stay in control and stay in power, in which case economic growth is the most important element of, uh, pro that provides the legitimacy. So when we have the consistent single, uh, very clear objective or ultimate goal, what differ is the approach and if, uh, if quoting uh, 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 Chairman, Chairman Mao is that the, the key contradictions changes over time. So when the key co contradictions change that your policy approach changes, in which case we do see continuity in a lot of objectives, but the measures or the policy approach have been evolving. But the ultimate objective goal was to, to say economic rejuvenization would give the, uh, the leadership a uh, very sound back, backing for continuing. If that's the case, of course we have continuity, but I would not put it in, 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 in the single continuity category. It's more about reaching this goal regardless of the approach or, or policy measures. So that would be, that would be my reading of policy evolution in the past decades. Uh, my question is how, how would you say this is quite different or is not as valid as your uh, sort of judgment of continuity? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That's a very stimulating question and a set of observations. I'm, I'm, uh, let me just pick quickly where you said the goal is to stay in power for the party, right? As, uh, and that the growth is the best way to do that. Uh, this is this concept of Zhuan Zheng, uh, that every country, the group that has enjoys Zhuan Zheng, that it has them, that group has the levers of power, is going to hold on to them. And you could say that in the United States, we have a political issue over campaign finance, that our elections are heavily influenced by funding 
which is kept obscure uh, by the Zhuang Zheng uh, folks. Uh, and so then it, it, if, if we just accept that every country has, a, a, if, it, unless it breaks down, uh, unless the Zhuang Zheng breaks down and the country starts to fall apart, which is clearly what we see in a country like Haiti and is what Xi Jinping has said happened in the Soviet Union, that they, they, the, 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 they lost Zhuang Zheng over the instruments of control. Uh, then you have to say, well, what if the and 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 of course growth and jobs is is key for the Zhuang Zheng in in the U.S. economy. Uh, so for each party that wants to be the representative of who's got ultimate control over the levers of governmental power, which is my understanding of the meaning of Zhuang Zheng, then uh, the idea is what instruments do they have to grow faster? Uh, and when I look at that panoply of instruments. Uh, I, and I see the decline that you mentioned in growth rates from 9% all the way down to under, under 6%. Uh, I don't necessarily see a trend uh, because I see a force behind that decline that I understand, which is a, 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 a reticence to, to invest heavily in, in, in expansionary uh, projects because you don't trust the financial sector and that you're gonna work on the financial sector uh, and then when you feel comfortable where that you can put your money where you think it's going to go, uh, then we'll see sort of a, an increase in, in, in investment emphasis that will speed up growth. And I think coming out of COVID, we'll also see a pent up demand for investments in the service sector. So the two of them, the urbanization investments that I know is high priority. Uh, and I think Scott Rosell, who who Bert Hoffman just mentioned, also thinks is a high priority, uh, is to bring the urban population. If they don't, they will never be a fully efficient economy. Uh, I think all of that is in train, but it is happening. It's in, it's, uh, it's underway. Uh, and it's being, the, the hiccup has been COVID. Uh, it's been the lockdowns. But I think the fact that China's labor force has not been disturbed. They've only, they've lost less than 10,000 people, uh, and not all of whom are in the labor force. You've had an enormous disturbance in the American labor force. It is, you know, we, we, we don't have uh, hospital workers. We don't have teachers. Every, the, the, the impact has been really dramatic and hurtful uh, in the American labor force. And China has avoided that uh, as the investments continue in infrastructure and education and other, other forms of expansion. So I, I, I see the decline over this last decade as actually almost intentional. Uh, and it was like a bit like the decline when they hit the, the rural economy hard in the mid-1990s by forcing them to plant more grain so that that bubble in the rural areas from the early 90s uh, really popped. That, that declining uh, prices and so forth made it possible to reform the state-owned enterprises because they could see that they were bankrupt. And I remember early 1997, which was, you know, even though it was Chinese New Year's, so of course there was a lot of red ink, uh, but that was what got attention, was the, was the sense that there was almost a preparation. And the book, my book has in it this notion of a cyclical theory of reform, that at, at, at when reforms are, when you have low inflation and slower growth, that's a good time for price reform. When you, when you get to the top, then you need to cut back and slow the economy, and then you get shakeouts, and firms that can't make it anymore drop out. Uh, and so I, this whole cyclical approach, we're now in a, in a cyclical downturn that is actually strengthening China for the next phase, which will be a pretty strong upturn, I think. All right, but we're back to the Guangzhou. In our, in our pre-talk, we talked about the Guangzhou on how to manage prices and outputs. Uh, final question, and hopefully brief, uh, Lei Sun. Uh, hello, um, very, uh, very happy to uh, have this opportunity. Firstly, I apologize for, for my very informal dress. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but uh, uh, yeah, I want to echo uh, Ms. Uh, Yao Li's question here. So he was, uh, she was talking about information cocoon. So I guess, you know, I have long been believing that, uh, you know, Xi Jinping is a quite capable leader. Uh, I'm, I've been very impressed by his uh, capability, actually. However, he, uh, uh, this National Party Congress, he has surrounded himself 
with all the you know, his inner circle. And it's not just his inner circle, but the inner circle of his inner circle. I, I, I believe he's a strong leader. He's very capable, very intelligent. But at the end of the day, I still feel that, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's necessary to be exposed to a dissenting ideas. I mean, we've seen some, some of that, you know, corrupting effects, you know, from Russia, for example, if you are surrounded only by, by the yes man. So are you at least worried some prospect in that respect? Thank you. Oh, thanks. That's a great question. And I'm overdressed, so I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's hard for me to see uh, what life must be like for Xi Jinping. Uh, I th this idea of conditions we haven't seen in a hundred years, uh, I, I think really reflects a, 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 a realization that the U.S. is a hostile force to China. Uh, and it gathered steam perhaps uh, when they, they, they could see that the U.S. went into Iraq in the, in, 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 and we just decided we were going to do it. Uh, we also see the U.S. really implementing the Syrian civil war. Uh, and we've also seen since then the, 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 the coup in Kiev. Uh, so I, I, I think that Xi Jinping must feel that he needs people that aren't going to be soft on the U.S., uh, but that are going to want to learn from it and be able to handle it, uh, and that he needs to trust people that are not uh, too enamored of life in America, because in a way that's... Uh, if, if you look all the way back to the 1980s, that may be what happened with uh, Hu Yabang and, ja, and, and Zhao Ziyan. Uh, they, they saw that uh, they could just become, uh, open up and become like America. And uh, the, the idea of Zhuang Zheng and the, the keeping a control on what Zhuang Zheng, in, in whose hands it is, uh, is, 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 is important for the long term. Uh, you don't want the, I think the, the, the Chinese leadership tradition doesn't want foreign money and money to be influencing their government uh, in ways that would hurt its long-term prospects is my take on it. And so I, I, I would agree with you. You ought to have people that are challenging you and disagreeing with you. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I, I just, uh, I don't know that he doesn't have those uh, in, in his inner group now, uh, but that he has higher priorities to sort of hold the country together into what he seems to think he's experiencing, which is a really hostile uh, approach on the part of the United States towards China's modernization. Uh, and so how does China face that attitude on the part of the United States? What does it take? What kind of leadership? What kind of advice? What kind of appreciation uh, is, is it going to take? So I think that that is what he's reacting to. And it's, uh, I don't know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think uh, the, in the past five years, especially the transition between the uh, Trump administration to Biden administration, but the continuity, as you just mentioned, the continuity of the policy, uh, in some sense, you know, confirmed their worst fear. Uh, so, so, so I definitely see that reaction. And, uh, as, as, but as I said, you know, I, I believe he's a very capable and uh, intelligent leader. I, I've seen, you know, his political uh, acumen is quite impressive. But still, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, there's some sort of fundamental law of humanity at play here, right? Still, at the end of the day, um, that's really, I, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> Let me add one thought. Uh, it, I, I keep saying to people that don't think that way that the Chinese Communist Party is a corporate structure. It has stakeholders and then it has a board of directors, which is the central committee. And then the board of directors appoints management, which is a, a, and an oversight view is the Politburo. And then in a daily day, it's the Politburo standing here. Now, corporations are very stable institutions. The, the corporate America, of course, relies on them totally. And so then the question is, uh, is this a Xi Jinping government? And is it a Xi Jinping choice of his colleagues? Or is it really the corporate information, which is also supplemented because there's such overlap with the government information uh, system? Uh, what is this a, a body or a, a a corporate decision, and Xi Jinping is the best and most eloquent spokesman for it, 
uh, but that it, it is a conclusion that's been drawn by the party consultative process that this is conditions we haven't seen in 100 years, uh, and we need to be very careful uh, who we appointed to handle uh, this very uh, seemingly increasingly critical confrontation with America. I know, just one, sorry, uh, one, one thing, I'm sorry. I know we can go on sorry. forever, but we, <laughs> I'm just losing the okay, audience, so it. I would like to wrap got this it. up. Uh, thank it. you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Keidel. This was really very interesting. Thank you for everybody participating in the discussion. I know we can go on for another hour, maybe two, uh, and, uh, but uh, I think we have to leave it for another day. I put the title of uh, Bert Keidel's book in the box, so you will have seen it. I, I will show it one more time, China's Economic Challenges, Unconventional Success. Uh, so if you want to hear more, uh, 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 read, read that book. And, uh, and can Bert, I add, Bert, that it's, a, it's an expensive book, but it has a very reasonably priced institutional ebook version. So uh, if you have a university or you have a company or something, it's a very, you, your, your, your institution can get it and make it available. That it's the, it's so probably in our, in our um, library already on, as an ebook. So uh, I would uh, encourage you to, to look that up. Uh, uh, but irrespective, you've given us a great appetizer for the book. Uh, and I, uh, this was long overdue to, to have you in this uh, seminar series, and uh, we, uh, we've enjoyed it all very, very much. Thank you so much, Bert. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Yeah.